Have you ever had this thrown at you? They always say something like, well, aren't anarchy's never been tried, or, or anarchy's never worked. Uh, okay, now, at what point does a myth become a lie? If we have something that people regularly believe, at what point, but, but they're confused, they're wrong, they believe something that they've been told. You just, you believe it because you've been told it. You've been taught it uh, as a child, it was taught to you in school. But at what point does that myth become a lie? Now, for instance, let's say uh, you, the person tells you the myth. Well, the gods live, live up on top of this mountain. There are, there are gods that live on top of this mountain. So there's your myth. Okay, so the skeptic says, I think I'll go climb the mountain and see these gods. So the skeptic goes and he climbs the, mountains, the mountain, and he can't find any gods. So he comes back down to the myth teller, and he's like, dude, I climbed the mountain. I went up there. There were no gods. Then the myth teller says, well, the gods are only on the mountain when the clouds cover the peak. So they're not up there all the time. They're busy doing other things. The, the way you can tell the gods are up there is because the peak is all covered in clouds. All right, so the skeptic goes up. He spends two months on top of the mountain in all kinds of weather. And he comes back down and he says, dude, I was up there the whole time. There were clouds. There were no clouds. There was rain. There was no rain. There were no gods. I didn't find any gods on top of this mountain. Well, then the myth believer says, uh, well, you can only see the gods if you believe in the gods. Okay, so now this pattern repeats with each time the skeptic investigates, the believer will change the conditions of the myth. So you can never really disprove the myth because the myth teller changes the rules of the myth every time you narrow him down on something. All right, now here's another myth. Before Columbus, people believed the world was flat. No, they didn't. Now, this has, been dis this has been debunked over and over and over. Scholars and even common sailors knew the world was a sphere going back into antiquity. Now, maybe if you lived in, in central Germany and had never seen the ocean, you might believe the earth was flat. But all you ha if you've ever been to the ocean, uh, and if you've ever seen a ship coming towards you, especially if it's a ship with a tall sail, um, the first thing you see is the very tip top of the sail as it's coming towards you. And the closer it gets, the bigger, you know, the more of that mast starts to ease up above the horizon. And eventually you'll see the whole ship. But, but, um, but the fact that the first part of that that you see is the very top of the mast, you're actually seeing the curvature of the earth there as the ship is coming towards you. And anybody who's ever been out in the desert far enough, out in a nice big flat desert, you can actually tell that the earth curves downward because uh, you can, as, as things are, as you look dis, uh, across a great distance and you see mountains in a far distance across the desert, you don't see the base of the mountains, you see the tops of the mountains. And the reason why is because the earth is curved. Well, people have known about this going into antiquity. It wasn't uh, the the thing that Columbus was was not trying to prove the Earth was round. He was trying to prove the distance from Europe to uh, to Asia, and he was trying to prove that the distance was shorter than people believed, and that it could be economically sailed back and forth. Um, now, there were other beliefs that there were things like giant waterfalls or you know sea monsters or whatever. But that's not the, the point. The point is that they actually knew the earth was a sphere. Columbus did not. He was not presenting some crazy, wild, new idea. People knew about this. But yet, even today, um, this is taught and, re and re referenced over and over and over that people used to believe the world was flat. And it's just not true. Well, this idea that anarcho-societies have never been tried or have never succeeded, this is also... I, you, I don't know. Where is it? Where do you make the divide? It, it, how many times can you debunk this nonsense and, and it still be considered just a myth? At what point are the statists who keep saying this over and over, at what point are they just lying? At what point are they not really caring to check out the facts, not really caring to check out the argument, that they're just saying this over and over, throwing it in our face, knowing that they're lying? I, I don't know. You know, for some, I believe they are lying. I believe they know the difference. But for most, I think they just, they, they blindly cling to this, their, you know, they hold their faith to this myth um, because they're afraid to let go of it. They're afraid to, at the concept, 
that uh, that anarchy has worked in the past works currently today. Anarchy, you know, uh, there's all kinds of ex of examples of how anarchy works today. Um, but this idea that a whole society could live without a centralized government, it terrifies some people. When in fact, that's been the default form of society throughout humanity, uh, uh, of humanity throughout the ages. If you think, if you if you could look at a time scale, you know, just like they show you in school, where the Roman Republic existed from this time to this time, and the Roman Empire lasted from this time on the on the timeline to here, and this is where the this empire took over, and this is where that empire existed, and. And we see this timeline, uh, if we look across the timeline like that, and we see where the uh, different empires existed in, throughout time, what we're not thinking about is all of the geographical areas of the earth and all of the cultures and all the people that live in those areas that were not affected by that particular state at that particular time. So, for example, if we think of the Roman Republic that existed, say, in 100 B.C., and we mark that on our timeline that the Roman Republic existed, um, are we considering that almost all the rest of Europe was in a stateless condition? And they were not just wild barbarians, uh, you know, attacking each other and hanging from trees or living in caves. There, there were very complex societies throughout Northern Europe that existed entirely stateless for all of the thousand years that Rome existed. The vast majority of Europe was stateless for the entire thousand years that Rome existed. I'm repeating myself here for a reason. It's to keep in mind. Think of the Vikings, for, for example. The Vikings, uh, from the time that they really, there was a population explosion in Scandinavia in the late 700s A.D., and that population explosion, uh, by about 800 A.D., uh, caused a situation where the uh, there there just wasn't enough uh, local resources in Scandinavia to support the population, so they began migrating out in every direction, and they migrated using their latest invention that they had uh, perfected, which was their Viking longboats. And these people moving out settled all over uh, northern Europe. And all of their all, all of their functioning uh, in their society was without a state. The Vikings essentially uh, occupied land at one point in time. Uh, let me count this up really quick to make sure. Um, if you consider North America, Europe, Africa, and Asia, yeah, at one point in time, um, Vikings were living on four continents without any centralized government. Now, uh, to a certain extent, um, they, like sp specifically in when, uh, when they invaded northern France, they almost immediately were converted to statists and, and, and immediately came in and began polluting themselves with the, with the concept, concept of statehood. But they did not do that in Ireland. They did to a certain extent in England. They did to some extent in Scotland. They it took a while before the um, the Vikings in modern day Russia really allowed statism to to grasp their their uh, society. Um, but it never really caught hold in Iceland or in Greenland. And, uh, you know, uh, w clearly it didn't, there was no Viking state in uh, North America. Um, the, the, whatever happened there is, of course, a matter of conjecture. But, but the point being that there are all kinds of examples throughout history of, uh, of societies existing without a centralized government, without a central government based on aggression, without the classic uh, thinking of how a state functions with the, with the monopoly of, of aggression. There are all kinds of examples of, of culture lasting thousands of years. And so at what point, in repeating the same myth over and over again, does the myth simply become a lie? And do we, do we just call them out on it and say, you know, you know that's not true. If you just think about it, you know that's not true. You consider the Americas. Sure, there, was, there were states, there, there, were, there were central governments 
in Mexico, in parts of Central America, even down parts of uh, South America, were controlled by centralized governments. But vast amounts of South America were never, ever, ever controlled by central governments. And vast amounts of North America were never under central governments. If you consider the... Uh, the Native American cultures in North America, there's quite a bit of evidence that the Mississippian or the Hopewell cultures were statists. Um, however, they were gone by the time that the, uh, that the European invasion started taking place, and the North American people were living in voluntary societies. Um, even uh, um, um, Thomas Jefferson uh, commented on this, on, on how the, he didn't understand exactly, that's his comments, he didn't understand exactly how they functioned, but he was amazed that they did function without a, an aggression-based government. And, and they did. Um, this was one of the confusions when, let's say, uh, in the early days when the, um, when the European-based uh, settlers would attempt to make a treaty or when the U.S. government would attempt to make a treaty with the Native Americans and they would get together people that they perceived as the chief or, or whatever, whatever terminology they used. These, of course, these terminologies didn't exist in languages like Algonquin and stuff, but, you know, but, the, but the English taped on, the English speakers, I should say, taped on these um, these words and these titles onto the Indians. And so uh, they would make an agreement, a treaty, and the, and the European-based people would think, okay, well, now I've made a treaty with, say, say, all these Shawnees have now made a treaty, and we can take part of Ohio. Well, no, you just made a treaty with the one or two Shawnees you talked to. The, because the Shawnees existed in a voluntary society, no one or two or ten Shawnees could speak for the all for all of them. They 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 there was no possible way they would accept that. So if you're making an agreement with Shawnees that are living uh, in eastern Ohio along the Ohio River, um, and then you try to inflict that upon uh, Shawnees living in in the the Great Miami ri River area. Uh, you're going to have a problem because they're not going to recognize any authority of any other Shawnee other than the one that you're talking to at the moment because they were a stateless society, and yet they functioned. They had culture, they had language, they had art, they had all the things that we consider to be a part of culture. They had them without a centralized government. And, and um, I'm talking about the Shawnees, but this goes throughout all of North America. There are a few examples of where aggressive states existed. But the bulk of all natives in North America were stateless. And there was a problem even with the state-based uh, natives, say, in Mexico, attempting to move northward. They, they really faced solid opposition in doing so and were never able to do that. Because, the, because especially in, you know, that, um, in that level of advancement as far as technology goes, a stateless society had uh, very distinct advantages over a state-based society, state society. So the Mexican uh, empires were never uh, successful at moving north uh, in, you know, out of what we now call Mexico. Okay, so, so then what do we do with these people when they constantly bring this back up that, the, that a stateless society has never existed or never been successful? Well, you know, how, how old do you think humanity is? If you're one of these people I was talking to a minute, that I was talking about a minute ago that believe the Bible word for word and they say, well, the earth is only, you know, 5,000, 6,000 years old or whatever – then, well, maybe we've got a different issue to talk about, and maybe we can address that separately. But if you believe the bulk of the evidence outside of the Bible, then humanity, as we know it today, has existed for a very long time, and yet there is no evidence that the state existed prior to about nine or 10,000 years ago. So let me just repeat that. Humanity has lasted extreme amounts of time, but the state has only existed for eight, for nine or 10,000 years. Prior to the state's existence, man figured out how to farm, how to trade, how to use gold for money. Um, they figured out art. They figured out music. They had musical instruments. They had beer. They had wine. They had uh, many of the things. Uh, and they developed all the way to the point 
of the Bronze Age before the introduction of the state. And where the state was, it was extremely limited geographically speaking. The state was only in a couple of very tiny little spots as the rest of the world went into the Iron Age. So a good portion of the world, a good portion of humanity, went from the, the Stone Age all the way into the Iron Age without the existence of a state.